Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I gave this talk at uh, another uh, Lakes uh, class uh, a couple months ago, and um, and was I was had the privilege of doing that. I hadn't give, given this particular talk before, and so I, I've talked a lot about pesticides. I started a nonprofit about well, it's close to 20 years ago called Healthy Lawn Team to uh, to uh, provide education about um, lawn care pesticides and. Um, health issues around that, and, uh, and then since then I've done a lot of other environmental work as the introduction uh, talked about. So, privileged to be here this morning. Let's get started. Um, so, I always like to start with objectives. Sometimes there are, is CME attached to what I talk about, but um, in this case it's just for all of our, our knowledge. Um, so, we're going to kind of do an uh, overview of pollutants in the runoff and um, types of exposures that people may have. Um, we're going to talk more in depth about pesticides and health risks, and as well with PFAS and health risks, because those are some of the hot topics currently, although there's plenty of others. It's just 40 minutes doesn't allow us to get in depth with everything. And then we're going to talk a little bit about action items, you know, things that citizens can do to get involved, and some of those resources that um, we can use to get involved. So sources of pollutants, um, I think we all know agricultural runoff is um, one of the largest sources of pollutants um, and phosphorus, um, and partly due to you know, the fertilizers and the manure, but you know, there's pesticides in that runoff also. Um, our roads, we salt our roads, there's heavy metals, oil, grease in our roads, uh, in our roads that, uh, from cars and, um, and from other things that uh, flows into our lakes. Um, there's also industrial and constructional runoff, uh, which the, the sediments are trying to control with those barriers. And also PFAS uh, from industrial uh, processes here and uh, across the state, across the nation. Uh, these are not just specific to uh, the Yahara Lakes watershed. These are issues that everyone is dealing with across the nation. And as well as um, homeowner runoff. Um, homeowners use more pesticides per acre than uh, farmers, in fact, and um, if, if you use those products, and fertilizers as well. Um, and it's the number one water quality problem uh, for us. Um, so to try to help that along, there is you know, a number of efforts, and maybe you, you guys probably know in Clean Lakes more about this 20-year Yahara path. Um, to push to keep farm runoff um, out of the lakes, um, you know, to try to reduce you know, phosphorus, blue-green algae, um, other things too, so to reduce everything that comes in runoff. Um, so what are some of the ways that we can get exposed to these, this runoff? Well, drinking water, um, there's only some pollutants that are tested um, for, because there's so many, you know, things in the water. So, um, so you have to, I guess, uh, when you're Looking at water, decide you know what are those things that are the most important or most likely to be in the water. Um, so specific um, uh, pesticides, atrazine and met metallochlor, um, are tested for, and then some PFAS. There are many many different um, uh, types of PFAS, and we'll talk about that later. Um, so drinking water can be a source of pollution. Um, for you, uh, but you know most of it is is checked. Um, well, the main the main players, um, fish um, accumulates uh, pesticides and other uh, you know PFAS, whatever it is, metals. You know we've heard about you know people getting toxic from eating uh, fish that had a lot of mercury and uh, PCBs. All a lot of that um, accumulated, and then you eat the fish and it accumulates up the food chain like that. Um, also, if you swim, there's always alerts out to our lakes. There were a couple of cases where uh, swimmers were exposed to, or I think it was actually a couple of people jumping in a pond in a golf course um, that actually got pretty sick, and I can't remember if they, there was a death involved with the blue-green algae in 2014. Um, and other bacteria, actually blue-green algae is a cyanobacteria, um, toxins and metals, um, you can ex be exposed to all those things when you swim. Uh, which we all like to do. I was out. Uh, I like to paddleboard on Lake Wingra. I get out to the middle and jump off and, and swim around. It's just wonderful, relaxing. I love it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, kinda, I look at the water and think, what's in here? I, know, I don't know. 
frankly, my mouth won't. <laughs> so, um, so as, as far as the you know where you can get a, we have a resource for drinking water, the Madison Water Utility um, has a water quality report, and um, of course they add you know fluoride to kill off bacteria. They add fluoride um, for the benefit of our teeth. There's some controversy about that actually. Um, which I won't get into. Um, there's also um, some filters on a couple of the wells for iron and manganese. And then one well, um, this is last time, but this is earlier this year, I don't know if anything's changed, but the, there's a VOC air strip around one of the wells. Uh, VOCs are volatile organic compounds. So, so it depends on the well as to you know, how it's um, you know, treated or how it's um, monitored. Um, and there's also, as a resource, this environmental health report card if you want to get into depth about what's in our water. And it get, it'll give you information about all the things listed there, nitrates, manganese, chloride, phosphorus, heavy metals, PCBs, blue green algae, and bacteria, all the things I've kind of mentioned so far, actually. So, so check that out. So I'll talk a little bit about mercury and PCBs um, in fish. Um, the Hara Lakes, uh, around us do have that, there is that problem, and there are alerts. I don't know if you can see very well how, um, you know, the recommendations uh, for, um, for people. And, um, you know, women of childbearing age are particularly vulnerable in nursing mothers because children accumulate um, toxins in their body in a little bit different way than we do. You know, actually, you know, fetuses are exposed to all the toxins that the mother is, of course. And so um, it's only recommended to eat, you know, uh, uh, one fish meal per week, week of some of those fish, like bluegill, crappies, yellow perch, sunfish, bullhead, and, and the trout. One meal per month for some of these other, other uh, fish that are more bottom feeders, some of them, like catfish. And then don't eat muskie, it says. But if you're not a woman of childbearing age and you're a man, you can toxify your body. So um, there you, you're, you're not as uh, susceptible because you're not, you know, um, taking care of a fetus. Um, and also, because children have a greater latency for cancers and things, that's why we protect children a little bit more or think about them more when it comes to these um, toxins. Um, but I have to say that there's also uh, uh, some lack of knowledge on our part about what um, these toxins do in our bodies, we, we, it's really hard to figure out how, where did this cancer develop from? You know, it's, it, it's, it, that kind of epidemiology is so difficult to get to that, um, you know, you, you just want to use the precautions at hand as best you can and, um, you know, follow these guidelines because they're, they're pretty good, but, you know, nothing's perfect in this world. Um, there are, are these toxins in our, our bodies that, you know, if we all got tested, would, we would find them. Um, I'll get into more uh, depth with pesticides because I um, know a lot more about them. <laughs> and uh, also because um, uh, I think it's an important thing for people to learn about because um, maybe many of you have been uh, used uh, weed killers, which are herbicides. So pesticide definition, I like to start with that because pe people think of pesticides as just insecticides, but really it's all of these things, herbicides, insecticides, rodenticides, fungicides, antimicrobials, anything that kills a pest is a pesticide, and these are the different categories of them. So sometimes you, you'll read something that says herbicides and pesticides. Well, herbicides are a pesticide, and sometimes people are using it in place of insecticide. Um, so where do we get exposed to pesticides? We were just talking about water, um, we were, and we were talking about food, um, and uh, it kind of varies. So um, you can also be exposed in the air. So if you're if you've had your lawn sprayed or your neighbors spray the lawn, um, that there is that drift, and also drift agriculturally. Um, maybe some of you are. Um, old enough to remember um, running through the fog on the farm, which is, you know, the pesticide spraying. I always get people nodding their heads when I say that, you know, that uh, people didn't know way back that um, when uh, the crops were sprayed that that fog of pesticides was bad for you. Um, so kids would run through it. Um, also, skin exposure, you know, so kids that are, um, you know, playing sports on a, you know, a field that's been sprayed, for example, um, we also have, used to have a lot, I'm glad to say used to have a lot of um, this triclosan in our soap 
Um, if you had bought an antibacterial soap, most of it has changed over because triclosan can cause some endocrine uh, disrupting problems in your body, mess with your hormones and um, contribute to breast cancer and things. So it's been taken out of our hospitals and our, our products. Uh, a lot of it has. It's still on its way. And then homeschool, workplaces, hospitals. You'll see the little signs when you go to the My Hospital Merida. It's just there this morning delivering a baby, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the little signs by One Cell Park. You know, I was like, oh, shoot, you know. Um, I tried to work with the, uh, my clinics and hospitals, but still, still people are valuing aesthetics over um, weeds, it, um, so over pesticide risks, rather. Um, they'd rather see the weeds gone, you know, in a quick way rather than, you know, thinking about what this is doing to us for the long term, even, even in our healthcare facilities. Um, so we know some things, but not everything, um, you know, and a lot of this, you know, has to do with we're exposed to so many things. How do those mixtures interact together? Okay, um, so um, you can read this. Um, you know, we know that these pesticides are toxic, uh, but we don't know what the effect of the chemical mixtures is. It's the most one of the most complex problems that face us today. Is you know what what are we doing with all of these grandfathered uh, products? Um, so it's, it's C CDC says the same thing, you know, we don't have a clear understanding of the chronic health effects of pesticide exposure. Um, let's get back to drinking water a little bit. Um, it comes from the surface and the groundwater. Um, and pesticide runoff um, is an issue. 95% of pesticides don't hit their target. Okay, so what does that mean? That means a lot of it ends up um, running off, seeping in the soil. Um, and like I said before, only certain pesticides are tested for. Um, if you have well water, maybe some of you have well water, um, homeowners need to test it themselves. Um, and I mentioned before that residents, you know, use more than egg, agricultural per acre. Um, so, and there is this maximum contaminant level that's determined by the EPA um, to try to determine, you know, how much pesticide is okay, but um, you know, still there's so much we don't know. Um, here are some of the uh, pesticides uh, that we test for in drinking water. I mentioned a couple of them earlier. Um, I'm not going to go into um, detail about that, but um, you can see some of these, you know, like the alachlor affects you, your body in different ways. So, uh, but there are some pesticides we don't use anymore, but we still have them in our watershed because um, they're still in the soil and still running off. And this, this illustrates that, that, you know, so some of the pesticide, and, you know, vaporizes into the atmosphere, even after it's been sprayed and dried, um, some of it can still vaporize because, you know, we're in a wet climate in Wisconsin. Um, some of it adheres to the soil particles and gets in our, um, our watershed that way. Um, and then it, you know, talks about absorbed by the crop. So I'm sure you can kind of look at this and see that there's a cycle for pesticides, just like there is for water. You know, it's attached to water flowing down through the uh, through our earth and into our water. Um, this slide just shows you know what uh, what's what's in our private wells. Um, so here we are, Dane County. We're way there. <laughs> so I had to look it up. I was like, which county is us? You know, I know we're south, but I couldn't remember if it was the upper or the middle. But um, we got the jumping pictures. Um, <laughs> so, uh, not a great jumper, actually. But 62% uh, um, of um, uh, wells will have, you know, detectable herbicides in our area. It's a very agricultural area in the southwest uh, portion of the state. So we have more of the herbicides in our wells here. Um, and uh, we particularly are concerned about atrazine because Anthracene is one of the more toxic pesticides that we know about, know of, and you can see once again, you know, Dane County, of course, has a lot of atrazine in its wells, and so it's uh, it's considered a pro prohibition zone. Uh, the uh, the counties that have the highest uh, amount of atrazine, we can't use it in this county anymore. So there has been, you know, good actions taken by uh, the DNR to uh, reduce, you know, use of atrazine. And um, so why, you know, what, what are some of the issues with atrazine? Well, there's a lot of them, but one of them is actually, um, um, I, I 
put on your male for male, male genitalia, basically that's, um, if you know what hypospadies is in babies, um, it's where um, the urethra, the meatus is the opening, is not on the tip of the penis, but it's underneath. Um, so it's more common if you've been exposed to atrazine. Um, it was, it's been found in the studies. Um, and it depends on the month that you were conceived. If you were conceived around the time that your you know, family was spraying the crops, then you're more likely to get it. So that's where you know, women in pregnancy are very vulnerable to these pesticides. Um, and there's, there's other, other studies too on pregnancy and, um, and pesticides and other toxins. You know, the time that you're exposed really makes a difference. That's true for, for toxins and um, also in mothers, we also talk about you know, exposures to bacteria and viruses, et cetera. So, so there are a number of issues. I didn't put a slide in for this, but um, there's also a condition um, for infants to have their um, abdominal organs outside their body. It's called gastroschisis. And uh, my friend Susan Davidson, who is a perinatologist, um, has, has seen a lot of these cases in rural Wisconsin. And she, she became curious about that and has done some talks specifically about some of those perinatal cases. Um, this is just an article about a young boy um, who had an unusual um, condition called juvenile dermatomyositis. It's a rare disease, and it can be associated with high levels of atrazine. Um, they had it in their well water. Uh, so um, this is about 10 years old now or so or more. Well, I guess this is from 2016. But um, anyway, um, the, you know, there's there are a number of health issues and risks with this particular pesticide. Um, so I, I showed you a slide about you know, how many wells there are in the different counties in Wisconsin, but overall about a third of the private wells have some pesticide contamination, uh, mostly from agricultural, and atrazine once again is, um, is the you know, culprit mostly. That's what we test for and that's what we're most concerned about. Um, and we still don't know everything that atrazine does. Yeah, but there's definitely efforts to, um, you know, to try to reduce it, and hopefully, you know, it'll be banned at some point. Another place, though, where kids can get exposed. Um, this is my daughter, who's now 18, um, and her little soccer buddies. Um, and uh, for the most part, when they played soccer, they didn't really run around as much as they liked to lay in the grass and roll around at that age. And so, um, kids are uh, exposed to fields. You know, and I guess older children too. You know, they take a dive for a ball and they're rolling around in the grass. Um, but the younger you are, the more risk you have because of your small size and your hand-to-mouth activities. Your liver is mature enough to process these uh, chemicals. And uh, longer cancer latency, like I mentioned before, that you have more years to develop cancer from exposures to things. And also, kids don't make their own risk management decisions. You know, my kids didn't know what, what, you know, what kind of uh, application had occurred on you know, various lawns that they played on. They're not looking for that. And even my, uh, my son, who's now 24, when he was 18, he would, took a gap year and he was working, um, doing some uh, kind of, a, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the organization, but he was, he was having to work around where pesticides were sprayed, working on some fencing and some you know, cutting of branches and things like that. Um, you know, he told me about this. You know, this is just the work that they had to do. He, had, he didn't have as much of a choice, you know, so, um, so what kind of issues are there with pesticides in kids? Well, one of the biggest issues is cancer, and I you know, mentioned that in here. This is a child, this picture is a child with brain cancer, and uh, there are a couple of brain cancers, um, you know, blastoma is the most common, um, that can affect kids. You know, it's not, it doesn't happen a lot, but if you've been exposed to pesticides, certain pesticides, uh, et cetera, um, you're at more risk. And you don't want that risk. Um, non Hodgkin's lymphoma is also a risk for adults, uh, a significant risk for adults. Um, neurodevelopmental disorders, um, um, there's a lot of them. But one of the things we see the most is ADHD, and that's actually been um, linked to increased um, organic phosphates in uh, a child's urine. Like they've detected that, you know, if you have higher levels in your urine, you're more likely to have ADHD. So. Um, there was also a study in Mexico, and this is quite a few years ago, in 1998, 
But um, what I like to still use this slide because it points out like if we use more pesticides agriculturally, um, then we would see higher effects. So that so what I'm showing here is on the one side these are kids uh, these are drawings from kids that uh, were living in the foothills, so not in the agricultural zone in an area in Mexico. And this is uh, the kids that live in the valley who are exposed to pesticide. And you can clearly see that there were some significant developmental delays and issues with these kids that were pesticide exposed to a large amount of pesticides. And so it's much less subtle than ADHD. Um, and the kids also had a lot of other issues, you know, short stature, um, their um, endocrine organs, um, like their sex organs and um, thyroid, etc. Like there, there were other issues with those kids. Um, years ago, the Canadians, they're a little ahead of us in some areas in terms of environmental health. Um, their family physicians did this pet literature review, uh, and so um, there are really good peer-reviewed articles about pesticides and health. And they, there's uh, associations with all of these things in pesticides. Um, I mentioned the non hodgkins lymphoma earlier. There's a lot of information on that associated with 2,4-D. Um, and you can read the rest. I won't read them all. Um, common household products often contain um, 2,4-D. And uh, I just showed pictures of your typical kind of weed and feed products. Weed and feed usually contains um, three different herbicides that work in conjunction. Um, so not only non-Hodgkin's lymphoma for 2,4-D, but prostate cancer is associated. Um, also, not just cancer, but heart disease and diabetes, we're finding that um, toxins also affect uh, your uh, cholesterol and your blood sugar and your body's um, fat stores. So, and uh, there's other you know, effects as well as you can read below on 2,4-D. Um, but despite that, um, EPA does re-register pesticides, and it, it basically comes down to opinion. You, you look at all the facts, and then you make a decision, and that's really, in a sense, an opinion. Um, and so what they decided was that there certainly was no harm, no harm would result in the general population or any subgroup using 2,4-D, you know, despite there being you know, health risks with it. Another common uh, product that we use is Roundup, which is, contains the pesticide glyphosate as an active ingredient. Um, it's probably most used, it, it is the most used um, herbicide uh, for homeowners and for applicators. Um, and so, you know, when you do studies on farm families, you know, there's three times the amount of birth defects in farm families that are exposed to it. So, you know, the Whoever is applying it, you know, um, walks in the house and you know brings it into the carpet, etc. And uh, uh, then everyone gets exposed. Um, and it's also a most common um, cause of pesticide illness, like acute symptoms in uh, landscape workers. So how come we're still using all this stuff? Um, doesn't the EPA protect us? Well. There's a lot of, lot of unknowns, and there's a lot of regulation, and it's based on this risk assessment model. Um, so we don't realize um, that low doses can actually be more toxic because it bypasses our liver. So that's one thing <clears throat> that isn't regulated for. We think of high, the dose makes the poison. Well, that's actually not particularly true. It doesn't work out physiologically. Um, and a lot of the toxicity testing um, uh, relates to ingestion and not skin and respiratory exposures. Um, and it doesn't, a lot of the, the regulation doesn't take into effect um, these immune system problems I have told you about and developmental effects. They're, it's currently not regulated for that. And, and the inert ingredients, including PFAS, <laughs> actually, can be added to um, pesticides to make it get into the plant more. And they've been called inert, but they're actually biologically active ingredients, too. Um, and mixtures are tested. You know, it's very difficult to test mixtures, so not, not usually. So what do we need to do? We need to be more proactive and, not, and, go, and do away with the risk assessment model and adapt the cautionary principle as a human species, which means even though we don't know all the effects, we're going to just move ahead and try to get rid of as much pesticides as we can, 
you know, because we know there's harmful effects, so why keep using them? If we can keep finding other options for, um, or, or changing our attitude about a weed-free lawn, for example. So, for example, um, the Manassa Parks um, still uses pesticides, but they do have a lot of volunteers pulling weeds in you know, many areas. And um, I'll give you an example of uh, um, my own sweat and grit. <laughs> I live near Westmoreland Park, and um, and I've been working with you know a group that's trying to create prairie and natural areas in the park. And so I round I round up volunteers through my nonprofit Healthy Lawn Team to dig and pull burdock and a number of other um, uh, weeds, you know, to avoid, you know, them from thinking they have to spray. So just to say, we can't manage a small area by removing the weeds. So, you know, there are those examples, and that's an action item, actually, is, you know, getting involved in some of those efforts to, you know, pull garlic, mustard, what have you, you know, it, um, it, to make a difference that way. Okay, let's move on to PFAS. How much time do I have, by the way? Okay, thanks. Um, so, PFAS is, um, has been around for a long time, but it's, it's been in the news now for several years because um, we, we've realized that it is in our water, um, and especially around Turox Field, where um, there's been you know, some fire retardant contaminants that um, a lot of, over the years that has seeped into the groundwater and gotten into um, the creek and thus in our watershed, and it's very, very persistent. There's many, many types of these um, polyfluoroalkyl substances, which is what PFAS stands for, um, and uh, you know, over 5,000 chemicals that are under this category that we use in our consumer products. Um, very, very persistent, like I said, and there's been links to cancer, thyroid disease, high cholesterol, ulcerative colitis and pregnancy-induced hypertension, just a smattering of, of issues with these substances. Um, they can get into the air, soil, and water, just like you know, pesticides, um, and into our drinking water. And I think 10 wells have been identified as having uh, some degree of PFAS in our system, and one is shut down still. Um, is that still true? Okay, I have my expert for that. Um, <laughs> Uh, they don't degrade, like I said, um, and uh, they move quickly through the groundwater, so they can um, spread out. Um, these plumes can be huge. I have to give, um, I, I forgot to give credit to, um, these slides come from Laura Ola, uh, who has done a lot of work on PFAS um, through um, her work, Safe Water on Badger. Stuff. So um, anyway, I credit her with these slides. She's kind enough to allow me to use them. Um, so. It's just showing, you know, a, a plume that um, was ten more than ten miles long, covering a hundred uh, square miles. So, they, you know, that's what happens once the, the, these uh, toxin gets down in the groundwater; it spreads out over time. Um, some of the major sources I kind of talked about them a little bit. That you know, firefighting um, foams are, are one of the main sources. Um, so there's lots and lots of uh, military sites, and that's what's happening on the Truex Field, that where we have groundwater contamination as a result of that. Um, and then, um, you know, I threw in this slide, um, it kind of ties into what I said earlier, that uh, PFAS can be used as surfactants, dispersed as wetting agents, um, combined with the pesticide to get it to stick to the plant. Um, or to penetrate um, insects' bodies, and that's the stuff. You know, that's how it gets into our, us too. If we, um, you know, come across a, a chemical like Roundup or something, and it rubs off on our body, it gets into our cells, our waxy barrier, by these inert ingredients, which are really biologically active. So, it gets into the plants and our bodies in the same way. Um, so, human exposure pathway. It's, Pretty much the same, you know. We eat, you know, fish and seafood that have, uh, you know, accumulated this. Um, even our homegrown produce can be um, affected. Uh, our drinking water, like we talked about, um, it's you know, for PFAS, dermal absorption is more minor, you know, but it's still there, and inhalation is still can be an issue. Um, 
there's four groups of chemicals that you know globally that um, we see a lot of, and um, it's, we've we've detected them in breast milk, corn blood, um, you know, and uh, we have concerns that these are you know affecting um, children developmentally. Uh, we don't have all the answers on that yet, and uh, and we also don't have all the answers on how they affect us as far as carcinogens. Um, there are some known sources um, in Wisconsin, um, like I mentioned, Truex Field, but um, Tyco Fire Products has um, got one of the highest uh, amounts of PFAS in the water, 202,000 uh, parts per trillion um, in the groundwater and surface water. There's less than the drinking water, um, but it's really all over. The Bad Jeremy Ammunition Plant, um, so that's why Sea Swab has involved safe water around Badger. Um, and, but um, other places too across the state. And uh, you can look at the numbers here. I, again, uh, yeah, Marinette at this um, uh, place, that's 2,000 nanograms per liter of PFAS, uh, different types of PFAS, just the one that, ones that we're looking for here. Um, Fort McCoy has a lot also, and then you can look down and see um, Wisconsin Air National Guard trucks field. It's, it's still got a lot, 39,800, but um, less than some of the other places, but still quite a bit. So a lot of places are not tested, and there's not currently environmental standards, but it's just coming. You know, since I gave this talk, before so much has happened in this last um, couple months, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. Um, so there's a number of federal agencies that can, uh, that, uh, <coughs> You know, PFAS could be regulated under, but it's still kind of in the works. We're just really, you know, it's really emerging and exploding all over in terms of, you know, how we're working on regulation. So, but still, you know, a lot of public drinking water, um, you know, has not been tested, only 90. So, um, so there are some efforts to try to get some testing done before and after that water goes to the uh, water treatment plant. So, um, in uh, this, this area in Marinette, there's been, you know, 36 families have been, you know, it's been identified, have been exposed. Um, but we just, you know, not everybody's been testing, so we don't know. Um, I would mention that they're very persistent. It's hard to get rid of them, and it's hard to filter your water for these chemical substances, too. So the one of the water filters that's, you know, very common in our households is the granulated activated carbon. It doesn't, it's not effective. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't do anything for us. And incinerating just puts it into the air. So what do we do with this stuff? You know, um, it's really you know you can't bury it. It's it's really a it's a huge problem. So um, earlier this year, um, so we saw, saw a petition for um, um, regulating PF, uh, PFAS compounds that got approved, um, and then lately. Um, Madison is going to be testing all of the wells um, the, um, now. Um, and we're working on adopting one of the toughest standards. Um, Vermont, I think New Hampshire, Minnesota, Michigan, all um, our other states that have some drinking water stand standards to try to uh, reduce it to 70 parts per trillion. I think it says, I can't read it really well, but for two different compounds, but there's so many others as well. And so just to give you an idea, you know, Indiana, uh, one of the states that's, you know, uh, one of their uh, representatives in their, um, um, I don't have her name on here, but um, she's involved in trying to get federal legislation to at least um, have more disclosure uh, that would, you know, so that the industrial manufacturers, you're getting to them, they would have to disclose you know, their releases of PFAS, you know, because we want to get it at the source before it gets in the drinking water, kind of slow the, the, um, the input, so to speak. So um, we need some of these things for our drinking water standards. We don't want to just mitigate at the end, especially with this chemical that you can't mitigate very well. So, um, so here's, here's another action item here. Um, if you go, are, are you, do you guys uh, go on Facebook? Do a lot of people on Facebook? Okay. Um, so if you look up this um, ban PFAS, or you can just put in PFAS and it should come up. There's a, a community campaign, you know, you can get involved. There's some information on there. I'm not sure how updated it is currently, but CSWAP has this site. 
um, as far as you know being involved and there is also a community campaign uh, page also um, on uh, Facebook that you can go to and they'll have a lot more information on the latest you can post things um, and then also um, work on uh, you know this issue um, when I, I checked in with um, Laura Ola in the last couple days and she said that um, one thing that isn't happening in our state is it's still quite, um, uh, I guess, a divide between uh, the aisles. And so, um, you know, contacting your legislator and asking them to reach across the aisle on clean water is one of the asks, you know, that the campaign has. Um, and so, you know, just sending a note, you know, an email um, to your legislator. Um, about that is a or calling their office and saying you're in you you um, are interested in this and that you you know just gotten educated about this and would like something done. Um, so local government also has been involved, you know. Um, but um, as far as Dane County and Madison, um, we tend to be more on top of things uh, to some degree, but there's still. It's still difficult um, to try to, to get actually because it's very costly to remove PFAS, but we're starting to move in that direction. But any push from citizens, you know, citizens' voices all together can make a difference. Whether, whether it's uh, PFAS or pesticides, um, the city of Madison currently has a pest management task force, which actually I'm on, and uh, we hope to reconvene soon. But, you know, if you're interested in trying to see a you know, reduction of pesticides in the city of Madison or a reduction of PFAS, those are, um, you know, there's another place that you can make a difference. Um, and talking to your workplaces, hospitals, clinics, other places, you know, about lawn care. Um, there's some resources for uh, pesticides if you're interested, and PFAS at the end, the cswab.org. There's a lot of information there. Um, there's other, other places you can get information too, but, um, and I'm happy to, you know, talk with you about that afterwards as well. So, um, this is, must be your side, huh? So, yeah, I'll take any questions uh, from here. Thank you. Yes? Are you thinking about the PFAS boom and the recent substation fire in Madison? Oh my gosh. So, enlighten me, I haven't heard about the how that relates. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right, right. I did think about that. I haven't seen anything. I mean, it's so recent. But um, anytime there is, you know, a big fire like that, you're right that they're they're using those foams and PFAS. And right, nobody's brought it up publicly that I've seen. Um, but yeah, that's true for all the firefighting. But yeah, what happens to that? Right, it's got to go somewhere. So yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. The, the first one, I, I do serve on the city's Integrated Pest Management Task Force, and uh, it's very difficult to uh, uh, make some changes in uh, practices. Um, how, can we, how can we get the city to do things like stop using glyphosate? Mm -hmm. how can we, there are communities around the country and around the world that have just said, we stop. Is it possible for a city like Madison to do that, that's my first question. Yeah, I think we're that, using it in lots well, of parks and all over the place. And we're both on this together. Um, so yeah, I think that um, the way that this committee needs to go is, you know, public input. I think would be good um, to push for that. Um, and then um, there are we don't have the expertise in some of the areas that we need it. For example, um, one of the um, I don't know her title, but. Um, one of the leaders, um, one of the, um, let's see, what is, what is her title? I don't know. But um, her expertise in parks, um, she has a degree in ornamental, ornamentals. We need, you know, somebody in parks who has a degree in organic land management. You know, we don't have the experts there. So they, so people are using the tools that they've always used. And to expand beyond that, you need expertise actually working within the department. And I, I picked on parks because parks is the, you know, one of the highest users of pesticides in the city. Um, they don't spray the whole park. Don't get me wrong. 
Um, but they do use it for weed management and conservation areas mostly and a lot of other things. So we need somebody that, you know, isn't, doesn't have pesticides in their tool bag as, you know, a quick draw, you know, so uh, that they know how to do something and be patient with, you know, the, the area of management. I think that that's a big element that we don't have um, with parks right now, so. And my other question is, on. Uh... I'm on the board of the Friends of Starkweather Creek, and we are concerned with the with those uh, sources of PFAS that have been uh, in that watershed, and uh, we're concerned because people are fishing and eating the fish well out of the creek and in Lake Monona, where the fish are going in and out of the creek. And we're just wondering. We've heard that there was going to be DNR testing of fish. Uh, can the testing really show what what uh, possible exposures there can be? Um, how how effective is that kind of testing to show that? And, and should we just add PFAS to the list of things that we put on the signs for people to say, hey, there might be in there, we shouldn't eat that because there yeah. are people eating those fish all the time every right. day, and they're right. very very concerning. There hasn't been any testing yet. Right. Yeah, we're not there yet. You know that we're. There's so many things that we need to do that, no, there isn't testing of fish that I'm aware of, unless anybody else is aware. Are you, is there, Maria? There's supposed to be. The city got some money that we're, um, people should be in our city for Midwest Environmental Justice Organization is uh, the group she's referring to. Over there against the wall. Yeah. Um, is eating organic really that helpful with all the other pesticides and yeah. pesticides around us? And I would think that even if you the test is organic, you're still getting things from the ground that have been there for a long time. Yeah, well, organic standards are such that the crops are actually tested. So they do, you know, you do have to have a soil that, you know, is pesticide free, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, over time, you know, things change. But, um, yes, it, it, there actually are studies that show if you eat organic, you have less body burden. And so I do think it makes a difference. Uh, but, you know, if you spray your lawn and eat organic, that's probably not good. And I know people that, you know, when I've said, hey, you should you know, not spray your lawn. They, they say, well, yeah, I suppose we're eating organic food. We should. <laughs> so. The other piece about eating organic is as you, but, you know, whether, whatever you're taking into your body when you're buying organic food, you're supporting a system that doesn't use those pesticides and right. pesticides. And so as that system grows and evolves and gets better management practices, we have fewer herbicides and pesticides in the environment. So you're right. contributing, by your demand, you're improving those systems. Right. Not to mention the qual food quality. Yeah, right here. Yep. Yeah, you. Yeah. Sir. Uh, I noticed that uh, uh, you did not mention that there's uh, routine testing uh, uh, of the waters for uh, dioxin. You did mention that oh. there's routine testing for uh, atrazine, but uh, hmm. uh, my concern with uh, the dioxin uh, arises from the fact that uh, uh, I'm part of a group that's uh, been in a 50-year study on that. I'm a Vietnam veteran, and uh, right now uh, I'm, I'm still suffering the after effects of exposure to Agent Orange. Now, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, after it was determined that a number of uh, weeds have developed immunity to uh, glyphosate alone, Monsanto and Dow decided to add 2,4-D to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this new formulation is called Dicamba. Mm -hmm. It's also known as in the list. Uh, there hasn't been uh, really any uh, health studies on uh, the long-term uh, issues with uh, that particular combination, right. other than the fact that uh, uh, you can look to uh, uh, the health history of uh, us uh, Vietnam veterans, uh, looking through the uh, uh, Veterans Administration's uh, very, very in-depth studies uh, mm -hmm. uh, that were done. Also, studies were done by the Center for Disease Control, the National Institute of Health. Uh, but uh, uh, 
uh, this is a rather well-kept secret, mm -hmm. but uh, I am concerned about uh, routine testing of the water sport dioxin yeah. because that's the cancer causing agent. That's a good question. Yeah, right. And I don't know the answer for whether they test for dioxin. I don't recall having put this together a while ago, having seen that, but I didn't go through the entire list. I think you know, going back to that report um, would, is a good idea to take a look at that, but I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But uh, it's a good question, because yeah, dioxin, in the making of dioxin and the destruction of dioxin, it's cancer causing. So styrofoam, I'm so glad there's not styrofoam here today, because that's, that is um, got di dioxin in its processing. Go ahead, oh, you go. Yeah, you, yeah right here. Here. I think it would be interesting to push the city to do a study on one of the big parks to have traditional weed management mm -hmm. and have not traditional yeah, right. calculate the cost per square foot of the different areas because we're really not certain if non traditional works. I mean, a lot of people don't know. Yeah. And then people could see it and compare it, then you would know how much it would cost to, to do it. There's some big soccer fields, it'd be easy to, mm -hmm. one on a damn road to divide it up. Do it that way. So it might generate support and people could go see it. Yeah, when it comes to the fields, um, there has been other places that have done some of that cost analysis, and um, it's it's really a difficult thing to convince you know um, an entity to go organic because up front your upfront cost is sometimes great, but over time it gets less. And so, but to try to get somebody to invest in that first upfront front cost, that's been one of the issues. Yeah. So. There are your highlights. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for those of us who love to go out and swimming in the lakes around here, do you think, based on your understanding of the risk for pesticide exposure, could you give any limitations for how much time we're spending in the water? Oh, I should. I, yeah. Children, I have not seen that. I think it's mainly you know ingestion there um, that you have to worry about and um, so I don't discourage people from getting in the water I'm in it and you know it's just it's, there's so many other benefits you know I think the benefits outweigh the risk I mean I think there's a small risk there but there's probably more risk to rolling around on the lawn you know being exposed so I don't think that's a huge issue but good good point Uh, well, I do know that bottled waters are not tested like city water, uh, but you don't see any, I haven't seen a study that said, you know, well, there's all this contamination because it you know, usually comes from a spring and it's way deep, and, but I don't, I, I don't understand why there's not the same regulations, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it looks clean, but, you know, that doesn't tell you a thing, you know, it, but it's the things you can't see, so. Uh, but uh, there's been some speculation on that just to say, you know, well, it's not tested. So we don't know when it comes up. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with um, how widespread it is to use goats for um, management of the plant in Wisconsin for um, invasive species and, and parks and things like that? I was just out in California and it's a yeah. hugely common it practice is. to have. They just bring in herds of goats yeah. and they just clear a, a hillside in one day. Yeah. You know, and they're doing it for fire suppression, I think. Yeah. But um, mm -hmm. I've heard that it, it's a very effective for um, <coughs> actually invasive species management. And that's where I've heard it too, California. I haven't. I don't know of any projects in good. Wisconsin where they're doing it. <coughs> but but uh, yeah, that, right. There are those other methods, you know, for for that kind of weed control. Yeah. One or two more. Yeah, please. What do you recommend? Oh, a bite blocker. It's a soy-based product, um, and I've gotten a new houseer to carry it. Um, and it was tested, and there was a JAMA article maybe 15 years ago now. Um, you, you can go online, bite blocker it's called. And um, it's, um, it was the best botanical in this study, and I've used it for years and years myself. You can reapply it, you know, as much as you want. And I mean, you probably want to wash it off, but you know, a lot of people don't wash off DEET. Uh, but it's be it's the best botanical of in that particular study. So, and I actually compared it to another botanical. One leg, the mosquitoes were eating me. One leg, the mosquitoes were not eating me. So, <laughs> so I anyway, um, n of one in that study. But it, you know, I thought it worked pretty good. And I, I enjoyed you know, I 
have time for one more question if anybody has one more. Yep, go ahead, man. Yeah, um, this question actually is for someone from the Green Lakes Alliance. I don't know if There's a lot of us. Fire away. We'll see yeah, who can I, make I, up I the just, best thing. James, I, we, we haven't really... So, I think, you know, so our the community survey as a general has been worried uh, about the number one thing that creates the algae growth and the cyanobacteria uh, that's in the lake. So cyanobacteria is what we call blue green algae. We don't call it algae because people swim in algae. We call it what it is. And so our main thrust Board, uh, along with the urban community, tried to narrow our focus to one issue rather than spreading ourselves thin because we have about a $200 million issue with just phosphorus. Uh, if, if we divide our time amongst a million things, uh, you know, if we want things to do well, and then we put have enough capacity, we will move on to others. But one of the things that we do do bring in different scientists and doctors to inform the, in the public so that people can make their own best choices at their own. And similar to our partnership with SaltWise, uh, you know, limiting the amount of salt that's used, um, it's definitely a practice we support, but it's because it's good for the lakes, but the, the, we're, we're driving a lot of our attention right now is, is phosphorus. Um, but, but valid point to that. Well, I want to uh, thank you again for uh, a great talk this morning. Hopefully everybody uh, enjoyed it. Uh,